We find that the climate system is relatively insensitive, consistent with the, the big uh, graphic that was shown earlier, uh, where it showed that we're not warming nearly as fast as the IPCC climate models suggest we should have been warming. So the point is, a lot of evidence now is, is being amassed, which suggests that the climate system is simply not as sensitive to our addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as most scientists think it is. Uh, I also want to say, since we're talking about most scientists, you know, I've, I've heard 97 percent, 98 percent. There's a recent paper by John Cook and co-authors who looked at thousands of research papers which have been published in the scientific literature to see what fraction, you know, support the scientific consensus on global warming. Well, it turns out that the 97 percent consensus that they found I am indeed part of, and Senator Sessions mentioned he would agree with it too. And my associate, John Christie, he agrees with it. In fact, all skeptics that I know of that work in this business all are part of that 97 percent because the 97 percent includes people who think humans have some influence on climate. Well, that's a fairly innocuous statement. And that's something that continually annoys me is those of us that are called deniers, it's never actually, uh, I think the D word was actually used by the chairman today. Uh, it's never actually been pointed out. What is it that we deny? Uh, also, you know, this 97%, well, what does the 97% consensus mean? You know, what do all of those people agree to? Well, they agree to something fairly innocuous. And it's something that most of us agree to, that humans must have some influence on climate. The question is how much? And how much influence makes all the difference in the world if you're going to be pace, uh, basing policy decisions, carbon taxes, regulations, legislation, whatever, on them. It makes all the difference in the world uh, exactly how much warming we can expect due to human activities. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to um, address the committee. There's two issues I want to talk about. First, I'd like to address the role of the White House in policy-relevant research performed by government employees, which this committee is obviously concerned with today. As a NASA employee performing climate change research during the Clinton-Gore administration, I was told what I could and could not say during congressional testimony, since it was well known that I was skeptical of the view that mankind's greenhouse gas emissions are mostly responsible for global warming, I just assumed that this advice was to help protect Vice President Gore's political agenda on the subject. But this did not particularly bother me, since I knew that as an employee of an executive branch agency, NASA, my boss ultimately resided in the White House, and to the extent that my work had policy relevance, it seemed entirely appropriate to me that the privilege of working for NASA included a responsibility to abide by direction from my superiors. But when I finally did tire of the limits on my interactions with Congress and the press, I resigned from NASA in 2001 and assumed my present position as a university employee where I have more freedom to speak on climate issues. Now, secondly uh, today, and more importantly, I'd like to present some of the latest scientific research regarding the relative roles of mankind and nature uh, in climate change. As you might know, there remains considerable uncertainty over just how sensitive the climate system is to our greenhouse gas emissions. But now we have peer-reviewed and published evidence, both theoretical and observational, that climate sensitivity estimates previously diagnosed from satellite data have been too high. The two papers describing that work are referenced in my written testimony. And furthermore, in recent weeks, I believe we have attained what has been called the holy grail of climate research which is a true measurement of climate sensitivity. We have discovered why previous sensitivity estimates have been so high and so uncertain. 
they have been contaminated by natural cloud variability. And we have even developed two methods of removing that contamination. An analysis of six years of our latest and most accurate NASA satellite data reveals evidence of very low climate sensitivity. When translated into an estimate of future global warming, it would be less than one degree C by 2100, well below the range of the IPCC's estimates of future warming. If this new evidence of low climate sensitivity is indeed true, it also means, and this is very important, if we have low climate sensitivity, that also means that the radiative forcing being caused by the CO2 we've put into the atmosphere is not nearly enough to explain the warming we've seen in the last hundred years. There must be also some sort of natural warming mechanism involved. And this is where the IPCC process has failed us. The IPCC has been almost totally silent on potential natural explanations for global warming. Oh, they mention a couple of external flu influences, such as volcanic eruptions and small fluctuations in solar output as possible minor players, but they have totally ignored the 800-pound gorilla in the room, natural, internal, chaotic fluctuations in the climate system. In my written testimony, I show with a simple climate model, a simple example of how small cloud variations associated with two known modes of natural climate variability, the El Nino-La Nina phenomenon and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, might explain 70% of the global average warming in the last 100 years, as well as its basic character, the warming that was experienced until 1940, slight cooling or constant temperatures till about the 1970s, and then resumed warming up until recently, since the satellite data shows that warming stopped about uh, seven years ago. But as Dr. Trenberth mentioned, uh, short-term uh, short results are no indication of, of, of future uh, potential. Uh, 